10-second security tip. Go. The single security operational metric that you should know is the average amount of time it takes you to detect, understand, and contain a threat. In order to score in the 98th percentile for security organizations, you need to be able to do all that in eight minutes. It's time to begin the CISO Security Vendor Relationship Podcast. Welcome, everybody, to the CISO Security Vendor Relationship Podcast. My name is David Spark. I am the producer, the managing editor, the creator of CISOseries.com. And joining me as a special guest co-host for this show is a man to my left right here. It is John Prokap, the CISO of HarperCollins. Big round of applause for John. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, David. So we are live, we have a live audience here in New York City. We are at the New York Information Security Meetup Group. We have a pretty much a full house here, which is awesome. This group meets, what, about once a month, I think? It, more, more even than that. And John, your office is just like around the corner, right? Two blocks away. Awesome. That's great. Well, thank you very much for joining on this. And I appreciate everyone being here. And I also want a big round of applause for Jobin, who is handling all the audio today. And our guest, who you heard at the very beginning of the show, is Jonna Till Johnson. She's the CEO of Namertes Research. Let's hear it for Jonna. How CISOs are digesting the latest security news. All right, Facebook. We talk about it on the show that was released today, but there is so much here that there's we got to talk about it some more. So to Facebook, and this is obviously the latest news that we've heard about them sort of invading really teenagers' privacy now for 20 bucks a month. So our data in aggregate is very valuable to Facebook. But to each individual, they view it as essentially worthless as they're happy to give it away to Facebook for 20 bucks a month. I don't see this ever changing. John, I'm going to go to you first on this. Doesn't your employees' individual privacy affect your corporate privacy and its security? I think anybody's privacy affects their corporate privacy security because you've got corporate data on your phone. And if you're willing to sell root access to that phone for $20, that includes corporate emails, any documents or any other data that belongs to the company. Now Facebook can access that and we don't have data sharing agreements, nor does anybody else with Facebook that's going to compromise your data. Did you happen to know if any of your employees had agreed to this with Facebook? I do not. (laughs) So that makes it even scarier. By the way, do you know of anyone who's actually agreed to this this sort of this tracking thing that Facebook did? No, but all I can think of is reason number 482 for having MDM on your phone so that you can protect your your corporate data. Anyone in this room either agree to Facebook's thing or know somebody who agreed to it? Anybody? So obviously you are only talk to other security people. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> all right. So getting consent, you were t- we were actually chatting about this yesterday, John. Getting consent to access data doesn't really tell people what you're doing with the data. What is it that consumers need to really know to be able to properly give consent? Informed consent is pretty difficult. It's required in Europe under the GDPR, but in here in the States, it's pretty vague as to what's being disclosed and what the company's going to do with the data. Or is this going to be used for my health care? Is this going to be used to provide me a better service? Or is it for any purpose that the company deems now or in the future they want to use that data for? And I think if a lot of consumers were given the choice, fully aware of what they were doing with that data, they may not consent to having their data given to a company like Facebook. John, is the, so the CCPA is really designed just for consumers, not for all users. And in the case of Facebook, people aren't necessarily consumers and they're still being tracked. Uh, although, actually, they are Facebook users. I guess they are a consumer in that respect. Or no, not really? No, Facebook is in the business of selling eyeballs to advertisers. Anybody who doesn't realize that is missing No, the but if I'm on the Facebook app, I'm a consumer of the app, aren't I? Uh, yeah, but it's uh, you're basically the product being consumed. Okay. So, uh, go on. What, what are you saying? It's that we... We have an issue, and this is a common issue, that where, where individuals, when they're not really selling a, a hard product or even a virtual product for that matter, and that the consumer becomes the product, then we get into some really messy privacy issues. 
I think that's true, but I'm going to flip this one around because I think I deal a lot with enterprise security and companies that are worried about privacy issues for their employees. Uh, and I see the Facebook issue as just a subset of the bigger issue of digital ethics. And an example of digital ethics, and it's a real-world example, what happens if you have an employee and take their phone, uh, and you know this employee has gone for con um, confidential alcoholism treatment? And you notice, maybe your IT, maybe your infosec, you notice the phone has gone into a bar. What do you do? What are you allowed to do? To what degree are you violating your employee's privacy? Um, you know, this is actually not a solved problem. And in fact, the whole area of digital ethics is beginning to explode because people haven't really begun to think about it. So in a sense, I think Facebook is doing us all a favor by raising this issue in its most blatant form and then causing people to say, well, wait a minute. How does this affect everything else? You know, in the last episode of the podcast, we talked about this issue, and specifically, uh, Mike Johnson brought up the the issue that Google has made some of these privacy mistakes before, but our awareness to privacy was not nearly as heightened as it is now. Uh, so is this just a situation of, you know, bad timing for Facebook, John? I think it's bad timing, but it's also, I think, fortunate for the rest of us that we don't have the fatigue in privacy that we have in security. Sometimes when there's a security breach, it's great. Another security breach, which is not generally my reaction, but I know people who said, well, all my records have been lost six times already this year. What's one more? Why is everyone talking about this now? All right, Rich Mason, the former CISO at Honeywell, uh, posted about the need to change the way we grade malware. Now, he noted that touting 99% blocking of malware that allows for a 1% failure rate and their end network infection, if it does happen, is actually 100% failure. So it's a classic kind of lying with statistics model, if you will. So, Jonah, I'm going to throw to you. Can we still grade security products like, you know, malware is graded? Like, you know, I, I remember um, Wendy Nather used to have a line saying, I don't care how many um, uh, raindrops your umbrella protects me by. So is this 99% protection when there's a 1% failure rate and then therefore there's failure? How do we grade security products? Well, this is a tough one, and I've been sort of wrestling with this since we talked about it, because frankly, I don't think it makes any sense to grade malware that way for exactly the reasons that Rich brought up. And that's why I highlight that security operational metric that I brought in at the top, because people, you know, I deal a lot with organizations that are trying to figure out what their metrics should be. And these poor humans are dealing with, like, NIST. God bless them. NIST has, you know, these giant frameworks that basically don't tell you what matters. They just tell you everything you could be looking at. And the bottom line is you will get attacked. You are probably attacked at the moment. And the real question is what you're going to do about it. And kind of the way I like to think about this is, in a way, it's we're moving from a model of information security as the plumbing model, which is where if there's a leak, there's a problem because either my plumbers didn't do a good job or my pipes had a failure. There's a failure, and we should, can and should protect the, the expect the pipes to be perfect to the hurricane model, where the hurricane model is basically we know a hurricane's going to come. We don't know how bad it's going to be or when it's going to hit or where it's going to hit from. We're going to try to build the house to spec. We're going to expect some damage, and we're going to use a variety of tools, both how you're designed, the materials you're made with, and also things like insurance to protect the house. But the idea is we will get hit, so the whole notion of my pipe is 100% non-leaky versus 99.99% non-leaky, that's the wrong model. And that's really what I would say on that. So, John, what, when, when a vendor is pitching you and they're touting sort of the protection statistics of, of their product, well, let's stick to malware because that's a kind of an easy one for us to look at. What is the stat, I guess, you're interested in hearing about? And, and are there some that you're just like, yeah, whatever, I could care less? Well, it, you're always somewhat dubious of, of vendor statistics. And it's, can you help me reduce risk in a given area? It's not, you're going to stop 99% of my attacks. I get attacked a million times a day. That means I have to deal with 10,000 problems. It's okay. <laughs> how much risk can you reduce so that way my detective controls what gets through have less to deal with and I have less that falls through the cracks. 
And do you find that vendors are having that conversation intelligently and, and feel that they can literally answer that question to you on the spot? Or they're like one of those, well, let me get back to you on it and maybe you hear from them or not? I mean, it depends on the vendor. Some vendors will, will come at you with a pitch, we solve 100% of X type of security problems. Which I know n nobody likes hearing. Nobody believes it. No. It's, it's uh, well, the, the, you know, the BS detectors go off. <laughs> um, no, but it's so... Give me an example of how a vendor approaches you and you're like, oh, I, okay, I, I like the way you're, you're coming at helping me with my risk. What, what's a good approach? If you have a problem with, say, phishing email. Okay. We can detect this type of phishing email. We can block the bulk stuff that you're dealing with now. And then we can detect these sorts of behavior. Obviously, it's an arms race and things will get through. So you still need to protect your endpoints. You still need to have an alerting mechanism where people can report messages, but to have an intelligent conversation around, these are the sorts of things that we're gonna help you with, these are the risks we're going to reduce, so that it's not everything gets through and now my help desk is overwhelmed, my team is overwhelmed, and we can't respond to that. You have to make it addressable. Here's how we're gonna reduce the risk overall. It's time to play What's Worse. All right. Uh, I think you guys all know how this game is played. The what's worth, there's already giggling happening. I'll let you know that we're going to play two rounds of what's worth. For those of you who are not familiar with the podcast and not have heard this, by the way, actually, I didn't even ask. By round of applause, how many people have heard the podcast before? I love the fact that I said by round of applause and about four people raised their hand. That's <laughs> awesome. We can't hear you raise your hand. <laughs> so that's good. I would say a good half of the, the crowd is, has heard the podcast before. All right. So for those of you who haven't heard, the other half of the crowd, let me explain how this game is played. I'm going to offer two scenarios to my co-host here and our guest. And the two scenarios are really bad security practices, scenarios, something like that. Neither one you like. This is kind of a risk mitigation game where you have to determine which one is worse of the two scenarios, which one you would prefer to have being, you know, it's, you know, would you like to have poison or rats? You know, something like that. All right, so here is round number one. Get ready for it. Question number one. This comes from Elvis Moreland of Ignite Assurance Platform, and he asks, what's worse, a CISO with a poor vulnerability management process or a CISO who has unknown IT acquisition, so like your shadow IT? So which is worse? You got bad vulnerability management patching or... You have just you don't know where all that shadow IT is. They're both pretty terrible, obviously. I'm going to say the shadow IT is actually worse because even with bad vulnerability management processes, at least you know what all your assets are. If you have good vulnerability management for what you know, but there's something you don't know that's highly vulnerable, you're going to be caught off guard. All right. So at least you know all your assets. Yes. Even though you're not plugging your assets well. Or you're not plugging them well. Yeah. yeah okay. All right, John, what do you think on this one? I'm going to be contrarian and say I'd rather have shadow IT and good processes because I'm going to hopefully assume the good processes assume great automation, which means the instant I turn my spotlight on the shadow IT, I will find it and contain it. All right, so there you go. Okay, good. Very good. So we have a split decision on that one. All right, so now we got to the second question. By the way, uh, let's, let's actually do a survey of the audience here. How many people think shadow IT, not knowing your shadow IT is worse? By applause. And how many people think vulnerability management patching, not having a good setup for that is worse? I swear that's split. Is that split? That is split. That is about 50-50 on that. Just like a, my co-host, I guess. All right, let's go to the second question. Here it is. This comes from Jason. He doesn't want you to know anything more about him. What is worse, an unlocked and unmonitored data center or auditing completely disabled on your infrastructure? I'm going to say auditing disabled. So auditing disabled is worse because that's only a compliance issue? Well, no, no, I'm going to say it's worse because oh, that's worse. Okay. because you have no idea what happened when something happened. And most attackers aren't going to walk into your data center. They could, and that's bad. You'd need to have physical security and lock the door. But it, you'd have to know that the data center existed, where it is, and that it's unlocked. So there's a little bit of security by obscurity. Not great. Okay, all right. So what do you think, Jonah? Unlocked and unmonitored data center or 
Auditing completely disabled on your infrastructure. I'm going to go with John on this, but for a different reason. Because 2019 is the year that more than 50% of workloads are getting moved to the cloud. So I actually don't care what's going on in my data center anymore. <laughs> so it's interesting. I, it, I did a shoot a while ago, and I was asking people about you know their IT department. And this was, by the way, at the AWS reInvent conference. And a good half of the people I interviewed, I said, well, what about your IT department? And everyone was like, or half of them were saying, what IT department? So, and these were new young companies, do not have even have an IT department. Let's take an audience gauge. So which is worse, an unlocked and unmonitored data center? You think that's worse by applause? One person. I appreciate your honesty. And so does everyone else think that uh, auditing completely disabled is far worse? Yes, all right. All right. Who's our sponsor this week? It's Contact Information Security. They are a leading technical cybersecurity consultancy through advanced adversary simulation and penetration testing. Context will help you answer the question, how effective is my current cybersecurity strategy against real world attacks? Established in 1998 and with offices worldwide, Context is perfectly placed to help even the most mature organizations improve their capability to prevent, detect, and respond to sophisticated threats. Context can test your infrastructure, web and mobile apps, review your source code, or even train your developers and employees to ensure best security practices. For more information on how Context can help empower your company and reduce the risk of your infrastructure, applications, and key systems from being taken over by malicious individuals or groups, visit contextis.com. What's a CISO to do? So for any of you who have to deal with budgets, I'm assuming some of you deal with budgets here or trying to get budget out of a CISO or someone who holds budget. You hold budget, don't you, John? Yes. You hold budget? All right. So... You can determine your budget by, I'm, I'm going to say the, the following four things. Meeting compliance issues or minimum security requirements. That's kind of like we're at level one there for budget determination. Level two, and by the way, one and two may be interchangeable. Being reactionary. Oh, there was a crazy you know, breach that just happened. We now have to plug this hole. And as we know, the, the FUD selling technique is never a favorite. You're not a fan of that, are you? No, I'm not. Not a fan of it. Now, the third, which is something you referred to earlier, is uh, reducing business risk. And the fourth, a little bit more aggressive, using security to actually enable the business, with sort of the brakes on a race car metaphor, if you will. Far too often, vendors have preyed on the reactionary and compliance buyers, but the growing trend for most CISOs, yourself, is the reduction of business risk. So John, have you trended down this path yourself? And if so, Walk us through how that's changed your budget. Can you give me an example of a budgetary shift based on business risk reduction? I think everybody trends down this path who's going down the CISO or other head of information security program because you start with the basics. We have to be PCI compliant. We have to be HIPAA compliant, whatever the, the compliance driver is that started the program. And then from a reactionary standpoint, why well, don't love the vendor FUD, never waste a good crisis. <laughs> <laughs> if, if you have a breach... Or if you have an incident that could be a breach, close calls, hey, we need these controls because that'll prevent this in the future. A good, a good way to do that. But also, you have to get to a point where you're measuring your own maturity and you're looking at the, the program and saying, how is it that we're reducing the risk of the business? Getting to enablement, I think, is a little tricky in some businesses because ultimately you're matching to the business risk appetite and also their budget. A highly regulated industry, military, finance is probably going to have more budget to do this. So, John, let me, let me throw it to you. You were shaking your hand there. What, what, what's that referring to? Well, I was just actually thinking about government and, you know, some of these businesses having a little bit more leeway and thinking possibly not. I like to put it slightly differently. A couple of years ago, we built out a security maturity model that has withstood the test of time. And basically, we looked at the following four ways. Ad hoc, which is what you call being reactionary. I, you know, I need something, I get the budget. And sometimes CISOs who are very high up at very large organizations say, oh, I, I can get whatever budget I need. I don't have to have a budget. 
Then there's benchmarking and frameworking. Framework-based budgeting is basically, I want to know X percent of my IT budget is going to go to InfoSec. That's a mistake. Benchmark-based is Gartner says or whoever says I should be spending Y on budgeting. Also a mistake, but less of a mistake. And then risk-based budgeting, which is the top, we call it anticipatory. We have four levels in our maturity model, unprepared, reactive, proactive, and anticipatory. Anticipatory is risk-based, and it's very simple. If you are putting a billion dollars at risk, whether you measure that billion dollars in market capitalization, in funds under management, in revenue, it doesn't matter. How much are you willing to spend to protect that billion dollars. That's a risk decision that should be happening at the at the corporate level. And the numbers usually have a couple more zeros than any of the other approaches. I will tell you the big reason that I really think that benchmark and framework-based budgeting is a big mistake is the model is, oh, I'm going to spend you know $100 on IT, so I'll spend $5 to protect my IT. But you're not protecting IT. You're protecting the company. So what you want to do is take a risk-based approach that takes a reasonable value of the asset that you're protecting, which is, at the end of the day, the company. And here's where what has to happen is InfoSec has to work hand-in-glove with the risk management teams. Most organizations don't have super sophisticated risk management. The organizations that do actually do a pretty decent job with their funding. And again, their budgets tend to be two orders of magnitude higher than other organizations. How sophisticated is your risk management, John? Oh, he's going to smile. <laughs> the the silence so here is books. so telling. <laughs> they sell books. Come on. I'm going to say that some organizations are more highly regulated and susceptible to risk. Yes, okay, very understood. You're also sitting in the middle of the financial district Correct. here in New York, so their, their level of risk and concern and business continuity issues are much, much higher than yours, way higher. I would imagine that their potential losses are much higher. All right, I want to I w- I take up something that we brought up in our other podcast, Defense in Depth, if you haven't heard that. I highly recommend listening to that show as well. We quoted Pete Lindstrom of IDC, another analyst firm, who said the ultimate metric to measure was risk reduced by unit cost. And when I brought it up with both Mike Johnson and Alan Alford, my co-hosts, it seemed like a completely impossible metric to produce. I'm going to throw it to both of you, Jonna. Is that actually, because you're kind of tilting to that in your answer right there. Is it possible to actually calculate risk reduced by unit cost spent? Yes, but it's hard. I would say it is possible, though, and here's why. John was talking earlier about vendor pitches, and essentially his point is, tell me what you're improving. The reason we're such fans of that operational metric I gave you at the beginning is if I can come back to you and say, listen, I can shorten your time to detect, understand, and contain, which is really a combination of AI, AI, and automation, detecting is AI, understanding is AI, and containing is automation. If I can shorten that down from 28 minutes to eight minutes, I can really contain the business risk and the risk, the damage that can be done. Okay, should I spend $100,000 to get that? Should I spend a million dollars? Should I spend $10 million? You can do that kind of analysis, and quite frankly, that is business. That's what people do in business. They figure out, hey, should I invest X to get Y? So the challenge right now is most vendors are not yet sophisticated enough to put their pitches in the context of, here's the risk I can help, here's the metric I can help you improve. Let's dig a little deeper. So one topic we bring up a lot on our show is improving the basics, doing the basics repeatedly, because it is often the basics, not your advanced persistent threats, that are the cause of a breach or security failure. So John, why, and I know you're a big fan of this as well, why are the basics so damn hard and why are people just consistently failing at them? Well, on one hand, they're not sexy. It's not, not at all. It's it's not something where APTs hey, are sexy. I'm gonna go patch this. If they don't have they don't have names, nicknames and things like that. But also, there's a little bit of fatigue. If, why has an infrastructure solved this problem? To John's point, there's an automation potential here. How can we automate the patching? How do we get things out the door quicker? But it, it's just not the kind of thing that somebody's going to build a career on patching. But if you patch your systems, 
you will have less threats that can, that can hurt you. And that's a, that's a point that I drive home constantly, and I've been saying this for 10, 15 years. So is there, I don't know, do you gamify it? I mean, how do you get the team up to speed so like everyone's like getting a little bit more behind getting patches done in whatever their basic security program you may have in place? You can slot car it or race horse it and say, okay, this region is patching 90% within a week. This region's doing 85. Why are you getting beat by these folks? And there's, sometimes teams will get competitive and try to patch better, but sometimes it just comes down to a resourcing problem. You don't have the people, you don't have the tools to do it. John, any idea on how the basics is done any better at certain companies? And are there models of certain companies that just handle the basics so well? Well, I would really suggest that you automate patching to the best of your ability. You shouldn't be using human resources for that. Again, we're not there yet, but the more you can, the better. I'm also thinking, when I think of the basics, I think of security training, and I think of the words that the uh, former CISO of McGraw-Hill used to use, that the biggest risk to security in your organization is CBUs, carbon-based units. Mm -hmm. We will do anything to mess stuff up. And there, you really do have to do all sorts of clever, creative gamification to get people to take the, take the security tests, learn the security internalize it. You know, one of the fun things about what we do is periodically, if we're going in and doing an assessment on a company, randomly call up their employees and try to get passwords. And that's always fun. What do you think of this pitch? All right. Uh, this is a segment that I just reintroduced on the show that I dropped today. And vendors send me in pitches. I ask for 30 second pitches. Sometimes they come a little bit longer. So I'll just say, if you're going to send me a pitch, please do. Keep it to, to a 30-second pitch. I do not edit these at all. So that's the big thing. They're not edited at all. And I'm going to read these pitches to both of you, and I want your critique on both of them. So here we go. The first pitch comes from Morgan Goodspeed of Carbon Black, and she says, Our extensible cloud platform consolidates security and provides you everything needed to secure your endpoints using a single lightweight agent. By focusing on understanding attackers' behavior patterns, it allows us to detect and stop never-before-seen attacks in real time. Our unique approach prevents more threats, gives you actionable insights, and helps you operate faster and more efficiently while reducing costs and complexity by consolidating multiple security solutions. I will start with you, Jonna. What do you think of that pitch? Uh, you do cloud what? <laughs> now, let me be clear. I actually am a fan of Carbon Black and what they do. That is one of the worst pitches I've ever heard, and I know John disagrees with me, so you'll hear that in a second. But it's just like, why are you leading with the fact that it's extensible and cloud-based? Tell me what it does. That's, you know, In journalism, they say you buried the lead because all the way down, it says, oh, we're looking at attackers' behavioral patterns. So it's basically behavioral analytics protection of endpoints. That's kind of cool. Unfortunately, it's all the way down, and I, you already lost me. So we could have pretty much zapped the first sentence. So the idea is we're, it's a cloud-based program securing your endpoints. I mean, is that essentially what we're talking about here? I would say it's behavioral analytics-based endpoint security is really where I'd come into. And that starts to get interesting because that's very different. That's next-generation endpoint protection. By the way, just so you know, we've seen this is not by any stretch the worst, the worst pitch. <laughs> yeah. Don't they, They've seen way, 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 way. This this is not horrible by any stretch. John, what, what is your feeling yeah, about I, this? I, I, I want to hear positive and negative. I don't want to just trash on these things. No, I might be grading on a curve because I have heard some really terrible pitches today even. But... I don't think it's a bad pitch, but I agree that the lead is buried. It is a little buzzword heavy. I'm a fan, frankly, of behavioral-based detection because signatures don't really work anymore. But I don't think it's a bad pitch. I just think that it could be reordered a little better. Cloud, for example, is the third or fourth thing you'd want to know. Where does the platform live? But what are you doing? You're protecting the endpoints. You're focused on behavior. You're not focused on traditional signatures, and that's why our product is better. All right. So maybe a little reordering killing of the buzzwords would make this pitch a lot better. I think so. All right. And get to the point right away. We were doing another game on the other show called What Do You Do? And there are a number of websites out there. By the way, check your own website. Make sure the second someone lands on it, they actually understand what do you do. All right. We got another pitch. This is an anonymous submission. XYZ is next-gen data loss protection. Unlike traditional DLP, we don't require policies or block employee productivity. What we do is make it easy for you to protect every file, especially IP. Using a single agent, XYZ, that's the 
company and mentioned here. XYZ Next Gen Data Loss Protection monitors file activity across endpoints and cloud. That way you always know exactly where your data lives and moves. The real beauty of our solution is we have all the files and file history, so gauging your risk is as easy as opening a file and looking at its contents. How does your company protect its data today? John, what do you think of that pitch? I think it's interesting that we're talking about this, them having all the files right after we've spoken about Facebook. But also, we've heard the patternless or non-trained DLP pitches before. How does this work? How does it know that this is important data? I'd be very curious to hear that. But, 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 but So keep in mind, this is a 30-second pitch. So would this be a good enough pitch that you would want to follow up and you would actually ask that if, question? If I were working on a DLP project, I might. Okay. I, I don't like that it ends with the how does the company protect its data because okay. that's it's a it's a phishing question. You know, okay. how, how do you protect your network? How do you protect your email? Hey, could you just tell me your entire security program? Exactly. Do you mind doing that? Sure, why not? All right, Jonah, what do you think of that pitch? I like this one better for the reason that you touched on, which is I know it's DLP. I don't know what's, why it's better than any other DLP, but if I were working on a project, I'd throw it on my list of things to evaluate and task my DLP guy or gal to go figure out the answers to John's questions. So I'm going to make a quibble here, which nobody in this room would know because it's, it has to do more with how it's been typed, and it's something I've mentioned many times. Almost every single pitch that I see has copy editing mistakes in it. it drives me crazy. All right, you're supposed to be as perfect and exact as possible. And let me stress this. You do not capitalize features of your product. Your product is capitalized, not the features. In this pitch, next gen data loss protection all is, is titled capitalized all the way through. Not important. I think, by the way, does next gen affect you in any way, saying next gen? 20 years ago it did. Maybe. <laughs> I, I don't think you need to say that. Uh, do, you, do you need to say next gen? What do you think, John? Well, I tend to use it and probably shouldn't, but then again, I, I'm a child of the 80s and keep remembering the post-postmodern man. <laughs> <laughs> and now this. All right. A lot of you sent in. We got a whole mess of questions here, and I'm going to try to get through as many of these as I possibly can. All right. Are you guys ready? This is going to be speed round of questions from our audience here in New York. Audience in New York, make some noise. All right. So, by the way, we didn't sweeten that. That is actually the number of people who are in this room. And we all have photos to prove it. Right, Michael? Yes. All right. Awesome. All right. Should our focus be security products or secure products? It's kind of a semantic question there. What do you think, John? I don't think it's really a semantic question. I think it's secure products because ultimately you're delivering a service to your customers and that has to be secure. And whether you do that by instilling a value into your developers to write better code or whether you put a web application firewall or other tool in front of it, it's a means to an end. Do you agree or disagree on this one? I think it's both because AI and automation are key, key components of security and they should be focused on the business case. All right. So next question. Now for CISOs, but we're going to let you answer as well, Jonna, because you get, you get uh, what, what am I saying? This is what you do. You look at new tech all the time and that's what this question's about because it just says, for CISOs, describe an email you got. So someone's interest, and this comes up all the time, that you got an email and you were so intrigued by the pitch that you responded to it, and why? And it was a new tech. It wasn't you know, one of the, the old guards. So, John, can you think of a, a pitch you got? And you thought, while well, you're thinking, I'll go to John. John, you got, you got an example. Uh, I'm, I'm easy. Uh, basically, send me a pitch, and I have time in my day. I want to hear it. I might only give you half an hour, but, and I may never give you half an hour again, but it's my job to understand technology. So unless it's excruciatingly lame, I'll take the call. All right. So th that's, a, that's a pretty low barrier to entry. All right. That's awesome. Uh, so can you uh, think of yeah, one? Yeah, I, I try to take one new technology call a month or so. So you learn 12 new to technologies well, every year? Not necessarily new <laughs> technologies, but new products, things I haven't experienced before in terms of being aware of it. So it doesn't always go anywhere, but it's good to know what's out there in the market. All right. I don't know if these are the same thing, but how do you deal with vendor slash endpoint agent sprawl? Is that the same I, thing? I, I think they're two separate things. Yeah, I think they're two different, separate one, things. One is having too many tools. The other is having too many agents, which arise from the tools. Right, right. But I, th I think the bigger challenge is endpoint agents because you start to run into conflicts. You start to run into 
the infrastructure team saying, do I really need to deploy this to every single workstation in the environment or every single server in the environment? And those can be much more politically challenging. A lot of testing is involved is the high level answer. Okay. <laughs> All right, Jonah? I'm a huge fan of ecosystems. Force the vendors to pre-integrate with each other and then use that as a selection criterion when you're buying. I don't have to worry about this because you guys have already integrated this and made it work together. I have heard this, the integration from whether you go best of breed, you sort of mix it all together, then you got integration nightmares, or you go with one vendor who's done all the integration themselves. Ecosystem, ecosystem. So everyone should just work together. And they, and they do. There are, so there are growing ecosystems. Palo Alto is working on one. You know, Symantec is building another. You can agree with them, disagree with them, but they are building out ecosystems f- to solve precisely this problem. All right. Given your depth of knowledge, what are your top three recommendations? Let's just go with one for a new CISO so as to avoid the common pitfalls that may arise in this artful dance relationship. So I guess it's just really a, a question of, here, I'm going to summarize it. What's your tip for a new CISO? Get to know the business. Get to know the business. What, what, is the, what are the crown jewels? What are the most valuable things that you're protecting? How long have you been with uh, HarperCollins? About four years. And how much did you know about the publishing business before you walked in? Not that much. Not that much. And so how much has your change of your security practice changed because you, you know the publishing business better? I'd say it's, it's changed somewhat. I've fine-tuned my approach but it's, it was really a matter of what are the top four things in the company that we need to focus on, and those were our year one protection objectives, and we built controls around those. John, you talked to a lot of CISOs. What's your number one tip for a green about to be a CISO themselves? After what John said, just to be clear, because his would have top priority, I would say reassess your team. A lot of times people have teams that are technically savvy but don't understand the business impact and end up bringing a lot of overhead. And I realize that's very difficult because people are expensive and it's challenging to put the team together, but be honest. All right, here, we've got a few more questions here. When considering a vendor or a partner, are you more interested in, in knowing the, the rep, the person first, or do you want to know the technology? And this comes from Jesse of Veronis. The idea being, is it important for you to trust the individual, the salesperson or the engineering team before you really get to know the tech or... I mean, it, is it, it sounds like a chicken and egg question here. I think it depends on what, how you're going to work with that particular vendor. If they're solving a point problem, the tech is probably more important. If you're looking for somebody to partner with you and develop strategies for reducing overall risk, a, a reseller, for example, the partnership is going to be more valuable. You're nodding your head, Jonah? Yeah, I was thinking about that. At first, I was going to say technology, but then I thought about the handful of really good salespeople that I know that move around the security industry and I actually trust their judgment as to which companies they decide to work for. So if they come to me and say, this, this company's good, I know they have a track record of picking them well. All right, next question. Can you share best practices when working with pen test consultancies, possibly our sponsors back there? I am constantly being sold on veteran talent but assigned junior testers. How can I work guarantees into our contracts? Now, do you do pen testing? Everyone does pen testing. Everyone does pen testing. (laughs) So do you feel sometimes you get burned by pen testing? I haven't had this particular problem, but one of the challenges or bit of advice I would say is, one, make sure you understand the scope of the test. What are the objectives? What are the flags they're trying to capture? What are they trying to demonstrate a weakness? So you can use that to improve your program. And second, if you're having an issue with the level of talent, have that written into the contract that you're going to get senior people or even name them. We saw so-and-so, so-and-so was phenomenal. We want so-and-so to lead this engagement. Jonah? General best practices for contracts, no bozos clause, literally. And that means that you are allowed to request a replacement for the talent and get the replacement. Sometimes you can't always get name support if you're not big enough, but you can always get no bozos. All right, so this next question we could do an entire show on, so I'm I'm going to try to isolate it down to one here. How would you build the ideal InfoSec team at a startup or enterprise? So let's just sort of say, what is your, uh, people always talk about culture. So I'm going to focus on that. What is your number one criteria culture-wise? I'm assuming you sort of, that's part of your hiring need. What does a member of your InfoSec team need to have, no matter what they're doing on the team, what do they need to have to fit in with your team? I would say that they need to have a positive attitude. We can do this. How do we figure this out? Intellectual curiosity, willingness to learn, and also 
a teamwork mindset, not this isn't my job, I'm a security operations person, not a pen tester, not this. We all have to help out when there's an incident, when there's an event that requires everyone to be all hands on deck, everyone's got to be all hands on deck. And that attitude is more important than aptitude. Do you have that attitude, Jonna? I agree that attitude is more important than aptitude. I would add to what John said, the ability to balance big picture and narrow tactical stuff, because you want to be able to sometimes say, you know what, this is a problem, but this over here is a way bigger problem, so I'm going to go deal with this, not, oh, the book says we must deal with this, so I'm dealing with this. But at the same time, you want somebody who's very structured and will actually deal with the the more narrow stuff when the situation permits. All right, last question here. In today's world that mixes InfoSec and DPA resolution, what is DPA? Excuse my ignorance. What does DPA stand for? Data protection. Actually, what is the person? Lena, you wrote this. What is DPA? Data Privacy Act. Data Privacy Act. Regulation. 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 So I thought it was privacy. All right, we're just going to say, in today's world that mixes InfoSec and privacy, which is pretty much what you're asking, right? Okay. In today's world that mixes InfoSec and privacy, what lenses do you look through to prioritize and determine your appetite. So I guess it's more of a situation, because we have been talking about this on the show, about the fact that security and privacy are really merging now. How is this changing the way you're operating? I think it goes back to what I said about crown jewels. So personal information, your customer information, your employee information becomes a crown jewel. And whoever your privacy team is, if you happen to be security and privacy, then you own this. If you're not, if it's somebody in legal, if there's a privacy officer, make sure you partner with that team. And I think that just goes to the general concept of you can't work in a vacuum in security. You have to partner with the other key stakeholders that support the business. And, Johnny, you must be seeing a lot of new technologies that are trying to deal with both of these, with security and privacy, yes? It's not so much technology. I would say the most important thing is to think about data classification in a new light and consider privacy as one aspect of that. We have a framework that we call information stewardship, which takes into consideration all sorts of things, like back to digital ethics, data that you have may be perfectly okay to have and have certain people see until you throw it into a data lake and you're throwing AI on top of it and all of a sudden it becomes a privacy invasion. And knowing that and understanding that data in isolation is not the same as data in a data lake with AI piled on top is incredibly important and it gets to the heart of any good data classification strategy. All right. So this brings us to the end of the CISO Security Vendor Relationship Podcast. I want to thank my co-host, John Prokap, CISO of the Harper Collins, and also John Attil Johnson, CEO of Nemertes Lab. This is the opportunity. By the way, thank you so much for being up here. And I got to thank this incredible audience here. We filled up the room. We even have standing room only, although we did have a handful of seats right here up front. But I think you did that so the photographer could sit down taking photos. So, uh, John, anything you'd like to pitch? You're hiring, I'm assuming? Yeah, currently hiring. So we do have some jobs posted. Awesome. And anything else you'd like to say? Any other pitches? Nothing that you're just hiring. Well, buy, buy books from HarperCollins, oh, yeah, right? We, yeah, we, definitely buy we books. We publish phenomenal books, so buy some. <laughs> Jonna, thank you so much. Why don't you explain, would you please, what Nemertes Research is and how you guys differ from all the other research companies that are out there? Sure, if I can keep it short. We're a research advisory firm. We're going on 18 years old now. I started the company when I was a chief technology officer, and my challenge was understanding not just emerging technology, but the business and operational impact of emerging technology. And there's an easy way to get that information, but nobody was doing it, which is to go talk to the people who are cutting edge deployers of emerging technology, see what works for them, see what doesn't work, see how they're organizing around it and making it work, and then share that information. And that's what we do. Well, thank you, everybody, for coming out to our second full live recording of the CISO Security Vendor Relationship Podcast, our first one in New York. Would you have us back again? That wraps up another episode. If you haven't subscribed to the podcast, please do. If you're already a subscriber, write a review. This show thrives on your input. Head over to CISOseries.com and you'll see plenty of ways to participate, including recording a question or comment for the show. If you're interested in sponsoring the podcast, contact David Spark directly at David at CISOseries.com. Thank you for listening to the CISO Security Vendor Relationship Podcast.